So joining me today on The Middle is my very first children's book author of Eyes That Kiss in the Corner. She's a mom, a vice principal with a passion for anti-bias, anti-racism, and equality, the all-around inspiring Joanna Ho. Welcome to The Middle. Thank you so much for inviting me. Of course. So first, tell me about this absolutely stunning book. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, it was inspired, I think, a lot from personal experience. I grew up really wishing I had bigger eyes, longer lashes, blue eyes. That comes a lot from watching, um, you know, a lot of Disney movies, Ariel, Belle, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, and just um, obviously not fitting into that mold and just really never thinking that I could be beautiful. And I have a three-year-old daughter now and, um, you know, I don't want her growing up thinking that she has to look different than she does to be considered beautiful. I think that's probably the easiest, most uh, simple answer. But I do think that um, what I realized from the reaction to the book is now I know that I wasn't the only person who felt that way and who was really impacted so deeply by this super narrow standard of beauty that so many of us just don't fit. No, and first of all, you are beautiful. And I'm like tearing <laughs> up just hearing you say that. And actually I found you through one of my best friends that I grew up with who is half Chinese. She told me about you. She found you on the um, the Subtle Age Asian Traits Facebook group. And I'm giving this to her to give to her baby niece when we're finished. Oh. And it's just, it's so just hearing her experiences and then and, and knowing that, you know, you're not alone. So you said it's been a good reaction. What has the reaction been like from other parents? Oh yeah, I mean, there's been a lot, frankly, of, um. I wish I had this when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I needed this when I, I bought this book for me. I don't even have kids. <laughs> um, and then also, of course, like, I can't wait to read this with my kids. And then there's been just like my favorite ones are, you know, if parents sending me pictures of their, of their kids holding up the book or telling me stories about like, hey, mommy, that's you, that's me. Or one, one parent sent me a, a message on Instagram saying she thought that I had this book written for her about her. <laughs> So That's things so like that are just, you know, make the whole journey definitely worth it. Amazing. And I have to ask you about the illustrations. I mean, they are absolutely stunning. I don't know if you can see well here. Everyone needs to just actually have this in your hands. It's, it's a work of art in every way, shape, and form. So who did the illustrations and how did you decide on them? Yeah, so the way that it works for children's publishing is, you know, a, a typically an editor will purchase the book and then will purchase the manuscript. And then the editor and the publishing house will typically des decide on the illustrator. So I really feel like I hit the jackpot. And it's just a, co a coincidence we share the same last name. But Jung Ho, she is Vietnamese and she lives in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like, so it's a little bit scary as an author because you just don't know what's going to happen to the text. Right. right. And I, um, first when my editor was like, Hey, we're thinking about this illustrator, check out her Instagram. And I scrolled through and I was like, Oh, I'm in love. And then she sent me the first just sketches. And I just was like, <laughs> you know? and then, and then the second, when I got the illustrations, um, with color, I was, I happened to be with my daughter and she did the same thing. She's like, that's me, mommy, that's you. And of course I was like, Whoa, all over course. again. And I just feel like the more I look at the text or I mean the pages, there are layers that she added into the story and like aspects of even like Asian culture that I don't, you know, I don't know. I grew up in the States. And so there's still a lot that I feel like I'm constantly trying to learn. And there are so many layers of things that she's woven in, in her art. So not only is it, you know, aesthetically really beautiful, but there's a lot of symbolic meaning throughout that even now, I mean, I flipped through it so many times that even now I'm like, oh, I didn't notice that before. Right. That's cool. You know? That is really cool. Yeah. So can talk to me about, uh, you, you touched on a little bit, but about your experience growing up and how it compares to how you're seeing your, your daughter. You have one, one daughter or two? I have a daughter two. and a son. Okay. So now compared to this generation that they're growing up in, where people are putting out beautiful things like this, compare a little bit and then tell me how it makes you feel. Uh, I think when I was growing up, so I am the daughter of a Taiwanese and a Chinese immigrant. And we grew, I grew up in Minnesota, so it's very white. I was really lucky that I had 
a lot of relatives close by. So I never felt like I'm the only Asian person, but looking back, I'm like, there weren't very many of us, you know? And, you know, growing up, the only thing that I really remember seeing of, with representation was the Joy Luck Club. And that wasn't until I was in high school. And I think that there's something when you grow up with immigrant parents, there's a lot that you absorb, but there's also a lot that, um, because, you know, my parents grew up in Asia, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, there's things that you don't think, like, I have to be super intentional about how I teach my kids their own history and their culture, because we don't learn that stuff in school, you know, just history, facts, like, and then, of course, cultural things, we're not surrounded by it. So for me, as a, someone who's very painfully aware of how much I don't know about my own history and my own culture and folklore and traditions, I, I feel like I have to be very, very intentional in how I teach my kids. So for example, we they were in bilingual um, preschool and I'm really fortunate that there is um, also an immersion element, a Mandarin immersion um, charter school close by that my son happened to get into. And so uh -huh. they're learning Chinese in school, which I'm really, really grateful for because I had to go to Chinese school like Friday night or Saturday morning, which was not cool. <laughs> not fun, I bet. Yeah. yeah. But in terms of like representation, it's really inspiring to see how many it's still like fractionally, like there, this is like the number of children's books. And then this is the number of children's books by or about people of color. So yeah. it's still quite small, but compared to before there, there are a lot more. And even this morning there with the um, ALA awards were announced like the Caldecott and the Newbury and a lot of other awards. And there are a lot of uh, just a lot more representation for Asians, but also of, uh, for black indigenous and people of color winning awards. So that's really heartening. Finally, and thank you for adding to what is out there because it clearly, like, like you said, there's not enough and it's wonderful what you're doing. And especially coming from, you're, you're also a vice principal. So you're in a school setting. I mean, do you, are you starting to see a change or do we, I mean, obviously we still have a long way to go, but from an educational standpoint, do you see forward motion? I think that's, uh, that's a really good question. I think that there is always a lot of really um, important and, you know, I would say disruptive in a good way work in education. But I think the reality is that the education system is not built to be equitable for all students, period. So people are fighting and they have been fighting for generations. But the reality is schools are very much the same, very segregated, very inequitable today, just as they were before Brown versus you know, Board of Education. So in some ways, the answer, my answer would be no, it's very similar. And then in other ways, the conversation around, you know, culturally affirming curriculum, mm -hmm. or disrupt texts, for example, there, there is forward motion, but there's also a lot of resistance. Right. Well, what is next for you? You're right. You have a couple more books coming out, right? Yeah, I, so I have another picture book coming out this year in September that is called Playing at the Border. And it's about Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist. He played at the border of Mexico and Texas to sort of send this very clear message of we should build bridges and not walls. Um, I have a young adult novel coming out next year. That's okay. about a young girl whose brother dies by suicide, but the community turns against her family saying it's the Asian influence and the pressure and essentially blaming her family and her parents for causing his death. So it's about her sort of dealing with grief, but also finding her voice. And then I have another picture book coming out called One Day. And it's sort of a mother's, you know, love letter to her son with an anti-toxic masculinity message. It's so I, everything you're doing is so wonderful. I can't wait to see what's next. What, where can people find you? Uh, what's your Instagram handle? Sure. It's uh, my Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook are actually, they're all Joanna Ho writes. Okay. So you can find me there. My website is also the same Joanna Ho writes.com. So pretty easy. Make it easy. And then before I let you go, I guess if there's like one piece of advice that you could give to, to readers or to parents or to future parents, just to, you know, to continue this message of equality and just to, to help to, to make a, a difference, what would that be? I think that it's 
to talk about the things you think are hard with kids. Like kids are ready and they need, you know, to know truth because I think that when we have those hard conversations or honest conversations or critical conversations, whatever you want to call them, you can do it at a developmentally appropriate, in a developmentally appropriate way that helps young people gain the tools to be critical observers and absorbers of this, you know, the culture and society and news around them. But if we don't have those conversations, they don't learn the tools. And I think kids books are one way to sort of jump into those conversations. Well, thank you. And, oh, I wanted to ask you before, when you mentioned um, the Joy Luck Club was the first time that you kind of felt represented, how old were you at that point in time? I don't remember, honestly, <laughs> but I feel like, I think I read the book in high school. So maybe we watched it in high school, but I don't know relationally when it came out versus, you know, that's when I probably right. saw it was in high school. Okay, yeah, and that's too late. That's crazy. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, well, it was so nice to meet you. And again, I can't wait to see what's next. Thank you so much for the opportunity.